Welcome to another episode of the Flutter Build Show. Today, we're going to explore how to wire up a fancy drag and drop experience using the super drag and drop package. A fair question right now is, why does Flutter need a whole package for drag and drop? Aren't there widgets for that? There certainly are, but they only move widgets from one place in your UI to somewhere else in your UI. But drag and drop is so much more than that. Modern UIs take advantage of dragging things across entire applications, like files from your desktop, or in the case of super drag and drop, from one app to another. Naturally, accepting files from elsewhere on the host machine, or serialized goodies originally dragged out of a different app entirely, requires communication with the operating system, or browser where Flutter is running. It's the smooth handling of this headache that really puts the super in super drag and drop. So grab your keyboard, and let's build a nifty drag-and-drop experience in Flutter. There's not a lot of preamble in this episode. We get to dive right in. For a glimpse into our future, this is what we're going to build. There's two panels, each capable of containing a grid of widgets. Those widgets are draggable back and forth, and can even be reordered within their own panels. Then, as a cherry on top, I'll add the ability to drag text files from my desktop and have their contents join the party. Let's do it. I'm starting off from a fresh Flutter create dash dash empty, and I'm adding the necessary dependencies in my pubspec YAML file. The only packages I need are dotted border to show neat preview effects, and of course, super drag and drop. Next, we'll start building our bare UI without any of the drag and drop functionality. In main.dart, I'll replace the body of our scaffold with a new widget called split panels. And because putting all of this in one file would be a headache, I'll create and import a new file, split underscore panels dot dart. In that file, I'm adding a new stateful widget, split panels, with two parameters to customize its inner grids. Next, in our state objects build method, return a layout builder and work out some calculations for important sizes. Now, I'll use those measurements to fill a stack with our desired children. We have two instances of this item panel widget, carefully placed within positioned widgets separated by a black line. Item panel will be a stateless widget that accepts a list of strings, a cross-axis count, and some spacing, and then renders them in a grid view. For the children, let's get cute and loop over our items list with the map method, and build our individual widgets to fill up the grid. I happen to know that later, we'll need to decorate this starter widget differently, depending on what drag and drop shenanigans are in progress. So I'm separating our inner widget from its coat of paint, and starting with a plain default presentation. This pattern of starting with a widget and iteratively wrapping it in a build method is pretty common within the framework and can be a neat trick. Now there's the matter of our two usages of items panel above. Luckily, we have values ready for cross-axis count and spacing. But what about items? Split panel is the stateful widget that manages all of this, so I'll create two lists of strings on its state object. These lists will be what the app manipulates as items are dragged out of one position and dropped into another. And now I'll supply those lists as values for the items parameter on each items panel widget. If I run the app now, we'll see our beautiful UI. Despite its award-winning visuals, there's no drag and drop functionality yet. So let's press on. To ready this code for super drag and drop, I'm going to create a new file, types.dart and add a few helpers we'll need later. The first will be an enum called panel, with values upper and lower. After that, I'll combine Dart's record feature with a type def to create an ultra lightweight data type called panel location to store drag and drop information. And lastly, because I looked ahead in the script, I know we'll also need this quick copy with utility later on when we start rendering previews. Next, there's three pieces of state that we need to store whenever a drag and drop process is underway. The panel location where the current drag event started, the panel location over which the current drag event is hovering, and the raw data that is being dragged around. We can now write two methods to update these values. First, on drag start, which accepts a panel location value and updates drag start and hovering data. The second method is called update drop preview, which is even simpler. This method will be called whenever the user pulls a widget they're dragging over a new location. 
In my Items Panel class, I'll add new required parameters on Drag Start and Panel, and then up in Split Panels, update the build method. Next, we can turn our attention back to GridView.Count and its children parameter, where I started with a simple widget, then wrapped it with extra dressing. Well, just like a bland salad, it's time for more dressing. The widget we need to use to start this whole process is called Draggable, which is actually from the Flutter framework, so I'll wrap the child variable in that. The Draggable widget's lone required parameter is called Feedback, which is what Flutter will show under the pointer when this widget is being dragged around. For our use case, we can reuse our child. We're making progress. If we run the app now, we can click on widgets and drag them, but we can't drop them anywhere. And that feedback preview looks pretty funky. To fix that, we'll need to see to a few more details. The next chunk of code really starts to interact with Super Drag and Drop, and this library's idea of a drag session, which is a chunk of data persisted across the entire length of a drag and drop, well, session. There's two widgets we need to use to get our drop preview looking better, but I'm going to worry about both of them in a new file called mydraggablewidget.dart. Here, I'll start a new stateless widget called mydraggablewidget. First, I'll add the constructor arguments and fields this widget will need. Now, in the build method, I can worry about those two widgets that will fix this funky UI. The first one is called drag item widget. This widget takes a drag item provider callback, which accepts a drag item request, and should return a drag item. This drag item object will contain all the necessary information about what's being dragged, which is especially important if you want this object to be draggable to other applications. Now we're managing our own state in a stateful widget, so I'll begin by calling on drag start. Next, we need to make that drag item object. There are two ways we can attach information to this object. One is through a property called local data, which is useful when we're dragging and dropping within the same application. This is one of our scenarios, so I will attach our data string to the drag item, which we must also return. The second way you can attach information to a drag item is by using readers, which serialize and deserialize information for drag and drops that either start or end outside of your application. To use this technique, call the item.add method and use the appropriate formats version for what your data is. For our purposes, this would be redundant because on drag start accomplishes the same goal of persisting the serialized information of what's being dragged here. In the end, remember that different solutions need to make different uses of local data and readers. So that's the drag item provider parameter. The next thing we need to supply is the drag builder callback, which builds the widget that will stick to the cursor during the drag session. Here, I'll wrap the existing child widget in an opacity widget to show that it's merely a shadow of its former self. Next, I'll supply a value for the required parameter allowed operations. And then lastly, the drag item widget class also takes a child parameter. And here I'll wrap it in the second new widget I mentioned earlier called draggable widget. This is what will fix our broken feedback preview from earlier. Great, we're all done with this file. I'm returning to split panels.dart, and at the bottom, where we return a draggable, wrapping the child in my draggable widget and passing the rest of the parameters. Notice how I handled on drag start without burdening my draggable widget with knowledge of the entry.key or panel variables. That's a panel location record we made earlier, but the information belongs here in the item panel. This way, my draggable widget can worry about what it does best, create a draggable child without being coupled to panels. Running the app again, we're now able to drag these widgets around and everything looks right, but dropping them requires more work. But before we get to dropping, let's make this a little cooler by adding an indicator of which widget is being dragged. This part is pretty much pure flutter and has nothing to do with super drag and drop, but I still think it's fun. Recall what that on drag start method we just called actually does. It sets the index and panel of the widget we're dragging, as well as the raw string value. So let's make use of those now. To start, I'll add a new parameter to item panel that will ultimately come down from split panels. Now in our build method, we can get even cuter with that child widget parameter we keep iteratively building up 
Like before, I happen to know that soon enough we'll need to modify drag start to accommodate drop previews, so I'm going to get that started now. Now, instead of using that same old container every time, we can do something different if the current element has the same index as the drag start. If this widget is the one being dragged, let's draw a lighter version of itself. And then for a little polish, since I'm changing the background of these squares, I'll also update my original text style to make sure there's always enough contrast. Lastly, I need to supply drag start to each panel, and then we're ready to run the app again. And look at that. Now when I drag around an item, its old placeholder reacts appropriately. Next, we'll set ourselves up to render a drop preview, and then actually drop a widget by using more goodies from Super Drag and Drop. I'm creating a new file, mydropregion.dart, to hold a new stateful widget called mydropregion. Classic. This widget will run calculations when the coordinates of the dragged widget change, so it will need parameters for each child's size, how many columns there are, which panel it is, and a callback to invoke when the preview should change. Of course, it'll also accept a child widget. In its build method, I'll start by returning a drop region widget from Super Drag and Drop. This widget has a few interesting parameters, so let's take a look. The first is formats, which specifies what types of data this drop region is prepared to accept. A good starting point is to use the formats.standardformats list. Next, it requires an on drop over callback, which is invoked every time the hovering widget moves over the top of our child. This function should return the allowed operations. Our implementation there will be pretty straightforward. Call the method to analyze the coordinates and return drop operation.copy. What we return doesn't matter when we're copying within our own application and managing our state ourselves, but it does matter when dragging and dropping across applications. Beyond that, update preview gets pretty fun. First, we do some calculations to figure out which row we're hovering over, and then some more to calculate our current column, and then flatten that into the appropriate index. Lastly, if the drop index has changed, we call our update method. The last parameter required by drop region is on perform drop, but I'll leave a stub here for now so I can finish up the drop preview. Back in our split panels widget, I'll wrap each items panel widget with this new my drop region class. Meanwhile, items panel can now accept drop preview and hovering data as additional parameters. Its build method is ready for more improvements as well. Because I'm about to start modifying the list of items passed in, I'll first make a copy. Next, if we have both a drop preview and hovering data, it's time to render that preview. I'll also copy drop preview with a check for the maximum acceptable value for our index. This prevents a widget hovering over in the far corner of a drop region from rendering a preview way past the actual last item on the list. Next, I'll control for when the user is hovering over the same panel where they started, which could shift the location of where to show the hovering widget's shadow. Next, I'll insert the hovering data into our copied list of strings to render. That's the only way to influence what the grid view actually shows below. The pieces are all in place to render the preview. All we need to do now is tweak the widgets this build method returns. I'll add another conditional in the spot where I'm building up that child widget incrementally, this time detecting when we're building the drop preview. When this conditional hits, I'll use the very fun dotted border package to draw a fitting preview. Our last details are to revisit how we calculate the string's actual color and add a clause for the drop preview and to use items copy in our build method instead of items. If we run our app again, look at that. Previews of where we might drop this widget. We can't actually drop it yet, but now that we've done all this work, that'll be the easy part. To finally add dropping functionality, I'm scrolling back up to split panel state object and adding a new method, drop. To begin, I'll add two assert statements to formalize my assumptions that I've not allowed drop to be called without these values being non-null. Then in one big set state call, I'll remove the string from its starter list if drag start is not null. Now, based on what we've already coded so far, it will be not null. But remember, shortly, I'm going to add the ability to drag in files from my desktop. And in that scenario, the drag will not have started from within this UI. Next, I'm going to insert the string value into its new list at the appropriate index. And lastly, I'll zero out my tracker values. 
Of course, something has to call this drop method. So down in the build method, I'll pass this to my drop region. It's fun that item panel never even has to know about this new method. Switching over to my drop region dart, I'll add this new method as a parameter and field. Then in on perform drop, I'll call the new method. Remember that the other way to use super drag and drop is to fully store the value being dragged on the drag session, which is available on each of these event parameters. However, for the purposes of this demo, I wanted to wire that into my state management, which means I don't need to pull the value out of event.session in perform drop. Running the app one more time, we see complete functionality. Items can be dragged and dropped all over the place. Pretty cool. Our final task involves being able to drag text files from our desktop onto this app and have the drop region widget accept them like normal. For this, in the my drop region widget, I'll supply a new callback for the on drop enter parameter. Just like the method sounds, this is the method that super drag and drop will call once a drag session enters this space. We didn't need this method before since we'd already captured drag sessions information when the draggable widget was clicked. But now we have the possibility of a drag session starting outside of the app. First, I'll check whether the active drag session has a data reader, which is super drag and drops data serializer and deserializer. If it does, I'll check whether or not the data reader thinks the file is plain text, since that's the only type of file I'm planning to support. Note that I'm only reading the first item's data reader, meaning that this app won't support dragging multiple files at once. To support that, write all this same code in a loop that iterates through event.session.items. Also note that on mobile and web, you can't read the values until the user actually completes the drop and on perform drop is called but I'll leave handling that as an exercise for the reader. All of this also points out why Super Drag and Drop has all this session stuff in the first place. Sure, we were able to juggle everything ourselves when we both started and ended within our app, but that would not be possible for a file coming from our desktop. Anyways, after the above checks, I'll use the data reader to open the file as a plain text file, read all of its data, decode the bytes as a UTF-H string, and call a new method set external data. I'll add that new constructor parameter and field, then define and pass the function in split panels. And now I can drag text files off of my desktop, drop them over the app, and it reads their contents and adds them to the UI. Really cool. So that's the super drag and drop library. There's even more you can do with this, including dropping other kinds of files, dropping more than one file, and dropping them from one app to another. Super Drag and Drop is built on top of another great library, Super Clipboard, which is similarly powerful, but uses your clipboard instead of dragging and dropping. On behalf of all Flutter developers, I want to extend the warmest thank you to Matt Nope, the author of both packages. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Flutter Build Show. Let us know in the comments if you found anything useful and what you'd like to see in future episodes. Until next time, happy fluttering.